Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now, just after the short break, we are moving on to the next session on primary care. Uh, our topic is supporting primary care during COVID-19 pandemic. We have a distinguished professor with us, Professor Michael Kidd. Professor Michael Kidd, AM, is the principal medical advisor and deputy chief medical officer with the Australian government, Department of Health, and professor of primary care reform at the Australian National University in Canberra. He has over 30 years experience working as a general practitioner in urban and rural locations across Australia. He's a, par, he's a past president of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and an honorary fellow of the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka as well. Dr. Kidd has worked for many years as a consultant with the WHO and other global health organizations and is a past president of the World Organization of Family Doctors, that is Wonka. In a personal note, I got to know Professor Kidd in 2016 in the Wonka SA conference held in Colombo when he was the Wonka world president. And since then, I admire him a lot due to his contribution to family medicine and primary care. Michael, over to you. Yep, and uh, thank you. So th thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, thank you and congratulations on this 133rd uh, annual meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. And it is a great privilege to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to just uh, turn on my screen. So, Sumitra, can you just tell me that uh, the screen has come up okay? Yes, we can see. Yes, we can see. Yes, we can see. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm going to talk about the supporting primary care in the COVID-19 pandemic. And obviously, I'm going to talk about what's been happening in Australia, but I think it's very important to also look around the world about what's happening in countries all around the world and learning about the primary care response in each country. Uh, I also have to emphasize that today I'm here as Professor Michael Kidd private citizen rather than Professor Michael Kidd representing the Australian government. So I'm here uh, in my personal capacity speaking at the conference. So uh, firstly, I want to say congratulations to the doctors in Sri Lanka. I've been looking at the figures and following the figures over the last few weeks about what's been happening uh, with COVID-19 in Sri Lanka. And it looks like you're doing very, very well. And uh, with the last time I looked, I think about 2,700 cases that had been reported for the whole country and 11 people who sadly had been reported as losing their lives uh, to COVID-19. Uh, and, uh, and I think that is a testament to uh, the, the strength of the medical profession and the strength of the healthcare system in Sri Lanka. And so congratulations to all of you. But I have to tell you, please do not become complacent. Please remain very vigilant. We are dealing with a very challenging virus. And Sri Lanka, like Australia, has the benefit of being an island and being able to effectively close our borders. We heard in the previous uh, presentation uh, from people in Singapore, which, like Sri Lanka and Australia, is also an island and is able to control its borders. But I want to show you what's been happening in Australia over the last couple of weeks. So here is uh, here are the, the figures for Australia, and you can see that Unlike Sri Lanka with your 2,700 cases, we've now had over 13,000 cases as of yesterday, uh, closer to 14,000 reported cases today. Uh, we have had many people who've recovered 
from COVID-19, but we also have had a significant number of deaths. And uh, yesterday, the number of deaths was 139. Very sadly, another six people have lost their lives in the past 24 hours. One of the things that Australia has been doing is an awful lot of testing. To date, we have conducted three and a half million COVID-19 tests. Uh, we also currently have over 200 people in hospital uh, with COVID-19. We have over 40 people who are very, very unwell in intensive care units. So many of these people are elderly people. And you can see what's happened. So I'll just go back. You can see what's happened with, um, with COVID-19 in Australia and how initially we had uh, a, a surge of infections uh, as this was happening in countries all around the world. Uh, we closed our borders uh, to the rest of the world. We only allowed Australian residents or permanent residents to be coming back into Australia and everyone who came back into Australia was required to be in supervised quarantine for 14 days in a hotel. They weren't allowed to leave the hotel uh, for the 14 days while they were in quarantine. And we locked down the country uh, for a six week period. And this meant that people were only allowed to leave their homes for essential reasons, for going to work if they're in essential industries, uh, for attending uh, medical appointments, uh, for going to the pharmacy to pick up medication and for shopping for essentials, which basically meant uh, food. And by doing that, we rapidly were able to get the uh, infections under control and, uh, and the uh, rate of infections fell uh, very, to very low levels and remained very low until the middle of June. And indeed on the 5th of June, we thought that we had no more COVID-19 in Australia because we'd only had two reported cases uh, on that day and they were in people who'd come back from being uh, from overseas who were in quarantine. But what happened was that we started to get infections occurring into the community uh, from people who were in quarantine. And this was mainly, we understand, through breaches of infection control. It only happened in one place. It happened in the city of Melbourne. And I know many of you listening uh, have uh, family members, of course, in Australia, including uh, in Melbourne. And we have had this further outbreak that you can see that's happening at the moment, which is mainly, again, in the city of Melbourne and surrounding areas in the state of Victoria. And, uh, and you can see that just for one state in Australia, um, we have now reached back to the position that we were in uh, back in March. And it just shows how highly infectious this virus is. And again, how we cannot let our guard down uh, because of the risk of, uh, of further infection uh, starting to happen. Uh, infection has spread into New South Wales. We now have cases of community transmission being picked up each day in the city of Sydney, our largest city. Uh, the borders have been closed between the states and territories of Australia. So there is no COVID-19 community transmission happening in Tasmania, Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, the Northern Territory or the Australian Capital Territory where Canberra is based. And for the first time, in over 100 years, the border between Victoria and New South Wales has been closed. The last time it was closed was in 1919, over 100 years ago during the Spanish flu pandemic. So the last time that border was closed was when we had a similar pandemic occurring. Uh, we ha now have uh, people again in lockdown in the city of Melbourne and in parts of the state of Victoria. And we, were hope we are hoping that we will start to see a decline in the infections. This lockdown has been in place now for two weeks and people again are only allowed to leave their homes for essential work, uh, for uh, shopping for essentials, for medical appointments uh, and for providing care uh, to other people when that's required. So part of Australia's national response has been our national primary care response. On the 27th of February, the Australian government uh, launched our emergency response plan for COVID-19. And alongside that, we developed 
our national primary care COVID-19 response. And in Australia, primary care includes the broad spectrum of primary health care. It includes general practice, it includes community nursing, it includes allied health, it includes mental health, aged care, disability care, home care, and also Indigenous health care. So it's a very wide uh, range of, of services being provided uh, to the entire population. And the primary care response was based on these five principles. And I think it's important to think about the principles and think about what's happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, are you, do you have the same principles underpinning your own national response to COVID-19? So the first principle, these are the five principles, I'll go through each one at a time. The first principle is about protecting vulnerable people. And we recognise that the most vulnerable people to COVID-19 in Australia are people who are cared for in primary care, people who are looked after by general practitioners and other primary care providers. As we all know, the people most at risk of COVID-19 are the elderly, particularly people based aged over 60, uh, becomes even more so when you're aged over 70, and very high rates of mortality in those aged in their 80s and 90s and beyond. So we need to protect these people. We also know that people who have chronic health conditions are at increased risk of serious illness if they contract COVID-19. Again, these people with chronic health conditions are being looked after in general practice and in primary care. We know that people who are immune compromised have increased risks and again, people being cared for uh, in primary care, often in partnerships with consultant specialists. And we're particularly concerned in Australia about our Indigenous population, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who often have significant chronic health problems from a younger age, particularly from age 50. So one of the principles was to make sure that what we were doing was protecting uh, vulnerable people. And very early on in the COVID-19 pandemic in Australia, we introduced telehealth. So this was to enable a GP and other healthcare providers to reach out to their vulnerable patients and provide healthcare where possible by telephone or by video call and to have face-to-face -face consultation available if it was required. But the aim was to allow vulnerable people to stay in their own homes and not have to come to our clinics unless it was absolutely necessary because we recognised that in our clinics there may be people sitting in the waiting room who either have symptoms which could be COVID-19 or may be pre-symptomatic, so may already have uh, healthcare concerns. So we introduced telehealth for vulnerable people very early on in early March. Two weeks later, we introduced telehealth for vulnerable health practitioners. So to allow health practitioners who themselves fell in those categories to be consulting from the safety of their own homes rather than coming into their clinics and to have their younger and perhaps healthier colleagues uh, available to provide the face-to-face -face consultations. We also introduced uh, point of care testing for COVID-19 in remote areas uh, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So to allow for very quick testing, the problem we had early on is if you're in a remote area, it could take five to seven days to get a test result back because the, the test um, samples had to be flown out uh, to a capital city. Uh, the result, they had to be tested and then the results had to be returned. The second principle was about providing treatment and support services to affected people. And we recognise that the majority of people with COVID-19 do not end up in hospital. Between 10 and 15% of people get quite severe disease or very severe disease and end up being uh, hospitalised, but 85 to 90% of people are being cared for in the community, being cared for in their own homes. And the people who are providing the medical care to those people are their general practitioners and other primary care providers. So we recognised that we needed to support our GPs to be providing ongoing care and testing uh, to these patients. 
but we also recognised we had a problem if we were mixing in our waiting rooms people who with, are with COVID-19 or are coming in for testing for COVID-19 and people with other health problems. So we set up uh, through the government 140 special clinics led by general practitioners right across the country, which have been responsible for testing and assessing people with symptoms of COVID-19. And uh, many of these uh, clinics are, are drive-through clinics. You can see a photo here uh, where people stay in their car. They don't have to get out of their car to get their testing. And uh, or they're uh, in uh, pop-up centres that we've established where people come out uh, when it's their turn and come into the uh, clinic to get tested. We also have clinics in the middle of the main cities uh, where people don't drive, where people uh, can walk or take public transport uh, wearing an appropriate face cover uh, to get tested. And we set up uh, about a third of these clinics in rural uh, areas to make sure that the rural community has access to COVID-19 testing as well. And a number of the clinics have been set up in Aboriginal medical services around the country too. The third principle was recognising that even while we're looking after COVID-19, we still need to be looking after all the regular healthcare needs of our population and the continuity of regular healthcare. Very early on, we looked to see what had happened during SARS and particularly in Canada, which uh, was uh, hit hard by SARS in Toronto and Vancouver and the whole population went into lockdown. And what we found was that there were more people who had had serious health problems and deaths from non-infectious disease problems from neglecting the management of acute new health problems, neglecting to have their chronic health problems managed well, uh, not having preventive interventions for cancer, not having children continue their childhood immunisations, not having mental health concerns being addressed uh, with the risk uh, increased risk of self-harm and suicide. So it was very important that we continued our regular healthcare service as well. So uh, after three or four weeks of introducing telehealth just for vulnerable patients and vulnerable practitioners, we introduced telehealth for the entire population. And, uh, and that runs until the end of September. Now any patient can reach out uh, to their GP using the telephone, using the video, and the government uh, pays a rebate for those consultations. Any GP can reach out to their patients particularly to their elderly patients, to their patients with chronic disease, and also to their patients in nursing homes, in residential aged care facilities, to provide continuing care. And then when necessary, the face-to-face -face care is being provided as well. And this, uh, this has been essential. We are worried, we have seen uh, from the Australian Bureau of Statistics that the death rate in Australia has been higher in, uh, for the month of April and the month of May. Uh, and this has not just been related to COVID-19. When you take out the COVID-19 uh, related deaths, there have still been more people who have died in Australia. And we are looking at this closer, but we fear that it may be people who had had symptoms of, uh, of perhaps a heart attack or a stroke uh, and had not gone to hospital or not contacted their GP. Uh, had stayed at home because of fear of getting COVID-19, and that's very worrying indeed. The fourth principle is about the need to protect and support our healthcare workers working in the community and recognising that general practitioners, community pharmacists, community nurses, allied health workers, people working in aged care, in home care, in disability care, all of these people deserve the same level of protection as healthcare workers working in hospitals. What we've seen in some past pandemics is all the personal protective equipment goes to the people working in the hospitals and the people working in the community are being neglected. And we were determined this was not going to happen in Australia. So the Australian government has been providing personal protective equipment to general practitioners, to community pharmacists, to allied health providers who are uh, 
doing uh, exposure uh, prone procedures uh, and are not able to physically distance from their patients. We've also, uh, we now require the people working in nursing homes and in home care services to the elderly and the disabled to wear a mask uh, whenever they're working uh, with their patients or their clients. And this is really important in order to uh, prevent uh, further transmission from occurring. So at the moment in Melbourne, uh, in, in areas of community transmission in Victoria and in Sydney, uh, we are requiring uh, the wearing of masks uh, by healthcare workers, and this is being supported uh, by the government. The final principle is about mental health and recognising the huge impact of this pandemic and of the need to go into isolation for the people of Melbourne now for a second time and of being in quarantine for many people returning back to the country for two weeks, the huge impact that this has on mental health and well-being. And we are very concerned about the ongoing mental health of our population, but also of our healthcare workers. Because as you all know, this is a very stressful time for healthcare workers. We don't know if the next person that we see in our consulting room, in our emergency department, in our hospital ward, may be someone who has COVID-19. They may be pre-symptomatic and not yet have symptoms of the viral infection, or they may already be unwell or very unwell uh, with COVID-19. And this continuing stress and anxiety is very concerning uh, among our healthcare workers as it is among our population. The Australian government has provided support to a number of agencies to provide both services, increased services for the general population, telephone and online services to support people's mental health, but also specific services for doctors, for nurses and for other healthcare workers who are feeling anxious or depressed fearful or despondent to be able to reach out and talk to another professional person and to get the assistance and the support uh, that they need. And this is absolutely essential. We are very worried about, we talk about a second wave or a third wave uh, in the pandemic. We are worried that we will have a subsequent wave of very serious mental ill health amongst the population, but also amongst our healthcare workers. Uh, I'm not sure, um, uh, Sumitra, if you'd like to uh, have time for some questions. So I might just stop there for the moment. I'll stop the sharing. And we'll see where we go. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. Thank you. So if, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them um, and, uh, and see how we go. Otherwise, I think it might be lunchtime in Colombo at the moment. It's, uh, it's dinner time here in Australia. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, actually, we are running short of time, but yet uh, we have, I can, ha I, I can uh, ask one question from you. Uh, this regarding the telemedicine. Uh, can you give a short uh, or brief account on the telemedicine and how it was uh, operated in Australia, especially in GP centers? Very briefly. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, Sankar. So uh, the telemedicine is being offered both through telephone and through video calls. Uh, we recognise that not every patient has access to a smartphone or a computer or an iPad. Um, many people only have the telephone. So the government is allowing uh, telehealth through either of those methods. And, uh, and it is available uh, through... The, the government uh, pays a, uh, a, an amount, a rebate, uh, to uh, that, each of those consultations. Uh, to date, uh, we've had um, over 10 million uh, consultations which have been carried out using telephone or uh, video calls between patients and their chosen general practitioners and other doctors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for that clear and analytical presentation regarding the COVID response of Australia.
I think we had a lot of similarities in managing COVID-19 in Sri Lanka as well as Australia, but there are certain points to be taken by us in optimizing our response, I think. So uh, thank you very much for uh, today's session, despite your busy schedule. And thank you for agreeing, and thank you for being with us.